Johnson believed that there was a quality to life beyond just the economic world. It's not just a single program or policy. It's all of these programs that kind of work together. Poverty actually did really drop after Johnson launched the war on poverty. What would it look like without all the social safety net programs? What if you took the bottom out? In so many ways, we live in LB Chase America. Welcome to American Compassion, a podcast that examines the past, present, and future of the American safety net. I'm Rebecca McEnroy. And I'm Michael Zapruder. In this episode, we'll look at the legacies of the Great Society, the War on Poverty, and of LBJ's presidency. What did the policies that came out of his administration mean for the American safety net? And why aren't more people aware of LBJ's social policy legacy? Lyndon Johnson's four years in office, his administration shepherded through the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Economic Opportunity Act, Upward Bound, the Job Corps, and Head Start. Community action agencies, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and Medicare and Medicaid. The National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, PBS, and NPR. The Urban Mass Transportation Act, Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Act, the Motor Vehicle Safety Act, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, and the Child Safety Act of 1966. The Housing and Urban Development Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and many, many, many other programs designed to eliminate poverty in America. And by eliminating poverty, he didn't only mean financial poverty. Johnson believed that There was a quality to life beyond just the economic world. H.W. Brands is a historian and biographer and the author of The Wages of Globalism, Lyndon Johnson, and the Limits of American Power. So Johnson's administration created the National Endowment for the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities. So, you know, we should support artists. Now, some of this was an echo of the New Deal because the New Deal had its Federal Writers Project and they supported the arts. In those days, it was basically because artists have to eat, too. It was a jobs program for artists. In Johnson's case, it was everybody ought to have the advantages of art, of music, and all this other stuff. It shouldn't be something simply for the wealthy. Johnson believed that everybody ought to have access to clean air and clean water. So if you can't afford a vacation home in the Poconos, well, okay, we got to clean up the air in Baltimore because we all breathe the same air. And it reflected, again, the fact that Johnson believed that a country as wealthy as the United States could make it a better place to live. He was not beguiled by the idea that gross domestic product was the full measure of what was worthwhile in a community. Yet this isn't to say that LBJ ignored the economics at all. You might recall from our first episode, Johnson saying, And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. Now, of course, we still see poverty in America today. So does that mean the war on poverty failed? In 1988, President Ronald Reagan delivered a State of the Union address in which he declared, Some years ago, the federal government declared war on poverty and poverty won. But Julian Zelizer, author of The Fierce Urgency of Now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress, and the Battle for the Great Society, has a different take. Even if poverty is still there and it's not eliminated, it's the wrong question. It's what would it look like without all of this? What if you took the bottom out? So what is the actual legacy of the war on poverty? And did Johnson's Great Society mission work? Does it matter? To help us answer this, we went to someone who studies this exact question. 
My name is Martha Bailey. I'm a professor of economics at the University of California in Los Angeles. And I'm also a co-editor of the book Legacies of the War on Poverty that was published in 2013. Martha Bailey spends a lot of her time thinking about the evidence basis for policies. She's the one who asks about the actual cause and effect of certain policies on social outcomes. This isn't a simple question of who gets credit. It's about asking how policies impact the lives and outcomes of actual people every day. If you want to know the impact and efficacy of a policy or program, you ask someone like Martha. And the war on poverty was a long time ago. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to learn not just what policies can do in the short term, but how they can really shape um, the evolution of, of human lives in, in the longer term. So it really caught my attention that people had written it off. And I thought, wow, is that really true? Did we know that? And I also knew that the state of social science evaluation in the 60s and 70s wasn't exactly where it is today, which also caught my attention, thinking if we applied um, sort of the standards that we would use today to that kind of evidence, uh, would it really stand up to scrutiny? And there were so many programs, so many. We could take up our whole podcast just listing and describing them. To say they wanted to accomplish a lot is a huge understatement. The strategy for the war against poverty that was laid out in um, Chapter 2 of the Economic Report of the President in 1964 was multifaceted. They talked about maintaining high employment, accelerating economic growth, but they also talked about things like fighting racial discrimination. That was a priority. They talked about um, improving labor markets. They were expanding educational opportunities, improving health. They were also doing things like um, assisting adults with education and training, and they also wanted to assist the aged and disabled. Medicare, interestingly, has talked about an anti-poverty program for the middle class. So before Medicare, your parents couldn't retire, and often if they didn't have enough savings, you would have to chip in for their hospital bills because they couldn't continue to work if they got too ill. So Medicare, in some sense, also becomes, it's not remembered as a war on poverty program, but it is an anti-poverty program for the middle class and also for, for a lot of disadvantaged individuals who would have had to spend a lot of their resources taking care of their, their aging and elderly parents rather than, say, investing in their own children. So you can see that there's kind of this intergenerational transfer component, too. And the interesting thing about these programs is that they didn't just focus on one element of reducing poverty, but they took into account many social drivers of health and employment and focused on redressing poverty intergenerationally from birth onward. Programs like food stamps, for example, were dramatically expanded under the war on poverty. They were started under the, the Kennedy administration, but dramatically expanded under the war on poverty. And those programs are near cash transfer programs that, that we know have fairly large effects on poverty in the short term, but also allow people to invest much more in the long term on a variety of things. For example, kids having enough to eat means that they can take advantage of better schools. They can take advantage of the teachers that they have. They can focus more, they can learn more, they can play more sports. There's more growing overall with better nutrition. Another thing to think about the safety net, Medicaid is a huge thing for a lot of low-income kids. A lot of the things that they're talking about, for example, in sort of the early childhood human capital programs is that there are lots of kids who didn't have glasses or they had hearing loss because they'd had ear infections. So these programs do two types of things. On the one hand, because um, Medicaid is available and also community health centers, which they can do a lot of screening and also types of preventative medicine, just handing out basic things like antibiotics to minimize ear infections, they can help prevent hearing loss, for example, but they can also help identify it when children have it and get them hearing aids. They can help identify the fact that children are having trouble reading because they can't see the page so that they need glasses. So these are basic preventative things that, again, help kids benefit from all of the other resources that are available. We also know that there is a fairly dramatic effect of things like Medicaid on infant health in the short term. It had dramatic effects on infant mortality rates in, in the 1960s as well. And one of the most remarkable and lesser known aspects of the War on Poverty programs was their role in enacting civil rights legislation. One of the things that I think is less appreciated about the War on Poverty is that a lot of the civil rights progress took place because a lot of federal cash was on the line. 
for schools and hospitals that didn't cooperate. So they had an office of compliance in the federal government of civil rights compliance. And so if your hospital didn't desegregate, you couldn't get Medicare funding, which was a lot of money. You couldn't get Medicaid to reimburse you for the services you're providing. So hospitals wanted this. And guess what? They integrated very, very quickly. And the federal government kept tabs on that. So this is an example of how a program like Medicare and Medicaid provided the carrots and the federal law, the Civil Rights Act, provided kind of the stick, the way to enforce that. So all of these things work in concert to help reduce disadvantage. So even if the war on poverty didn't eliminate poverty, like Johnson predicted and Reagan denounced, there is a lot it can teach us. Again, Martha Bailey. One thing we learn is that eliminating poverty is really, really hard. I think it would be very hard to get there with even a very broad set of of policies and proposals. That said, there's a lot of, of the disadvantage and the poverty we see today are the direct result of policy choices that we're making. So in the 1960s, they enacted all of these things without a lot of evidence basis. They didn't know what wouldn't work, what would work, how these things were going to all fit together. But the idea is they had a concerted strategy against poverty to try to alleviate disadvantage, not just disadvantage in the short term, but allow people to really make their lives better. And, And one of the fascinating things for me that comes out of this is that in large part, some of those programs really succeeded. And and I think dramatic reductions in the poverty rates of Black Americans today can be traced directly to the war on poverty's both multifaceted set of programs to both reduce racial discrimination, increase nutritional assistance, increase medical care, provide early childhood education, all of which was working to increase the opportunities of kids in those families and also improve lives. So the legacy of the war on poverty, the title of Martha's book, sounds pretty positive, but questions remain. One thing that puzzles me and has always puzzled me is that the Johnson administration doesn't take a lot of credit for the fairly large drop in poverty that happened on its watch. The poverty rate fell from about 19 to 15% over the first five years of the program. Now, I'm not claiming that they were responsible for that. That's a different question. But that's never stopped an administration from claiming credit. So why didn't they do more to kind of claim those successes at that moment in time? And and I, I still find that very, very puzzling. Maybe it's that the Johnson administration was just too focused on other issues. Um, Another reason I think is that the war on poverty did a lot of things that kind of angered everyone for some reason. For some groups, it was government overreach. So the the federal government is coming into local communities. They're handing out money. They are overturning the, the political structures, which was part of the objective that had contributed to racism and exclusion. That was one of the federal objectives in implementing some of these programs. But at the same time, they managed to make everyone mad who had that political power to begin with. So that's kind of one side that's angering a whole lot of people. On the left, you see, for example, a lot of the advocates that really wanted to eliminate poverty, wanted to eliminate a lot of the racial exclusion that had gone on during that era, were disappointed the programs didn't go far enough. So when Martin Luther King Jr. is writing his book, Where Do We Go From Here?, he's talking about um, much more aggressive programs, guaranteed income, much more aggressive approaches to ending poverty, because he thought that progress against poverty had stalled. So in some sense, the war on poverty kind of wades in in the middle, it's doing some things, but not everything. And for some people, even those things were too much. So it, it made everybody mad. The other thing I'll say is it was just difficult at that moment to have metrics of success. The war on poverty is a really interesting era because it's around this time that social scientists start thinking really hard about how to evaluate programs. It turns out it's really hard. And if you don't have metrics of success for different programs, it's really hard to make the case politically that you should continue them. And and in particular, that you should continue to spend a lot of money on them. So I think for a variety of reasons, the war on poverty wasn't viewed immediately as a big success. Some political and also just some evaluative. I think there's a third reason too. And one of the things is that the official poverty measure in the United States was adopted uh, right before um, a lot of the war on poverty programs were enacted. And one of the ironies of that particular measure is that it fails to account for so many of the policies and programs that were being enacted in that period. So for example, it's based only on income, 
but it doesn't include things like a lot of the government benefits, like food assistance and, say, housing assistance that were part of the war on poverty. So in some sense, it completely misses some of the the poverty reducing effects of of some of those poverty programs. So that official metric is not showing nearly the decline of metrics that have been adopted more recently, like the supplemental poverty measure. And there was another factor why LBJ isn't remembered for his overwhelming success on his social policy and why people even today have relatively no idea that it was Johnson who passed Medicare and Medicaid and Head Start or was responsible for the myriad of other programs. See, when you talk about Lyndon Johnson on the safety net, when you talk about Johnson in general, you have to say, well, what he did in domestic affairs was wonderful, but there's Vietnam. You're listening to American Compassion. I'm Michael Zapruder. And I'm Rebecca McEnroy. Stay with us. The people who are doing the work every day, they're tough, they got thick skins, they got big hearts. We have to take care of each other. You're listening to American Compassion because you're interested in how the American safety net came to be. So check out the stories of those who are a vital part of that safety net today. I just wish that people would see unhoused folks as their brothers and sisters. When we lean into people as deserving and loving members of our community, that's how we solve this thing. Find Help Films is a documentary storytelling initiative that shines a spotlight on some of the incredible people and organizations working to improve lives, build community, and make sure every American has the safety net they need to thrive. I still believe America can be that shining city upon the hill for everyone. Watch the films and subscribe to the YouTube channel at findhelpfilms.com. Welcome back to American Compassion. I'm Michael Zapruder. And I'm Rebecca McEnroy. Robert Caro has devoted much of his life's work to chronicling the career and life of Lyndon Johnson. He's written four books about Johnson and is currently working on the fifth and final volume of this biography. So through 1965, he's passing all this safety net legislation he has a lot more in, in um, his mind. In July of 65, he has this new aide, Joe Califano, come down to the ranch, and he takes Califano for a swim. It's typical, in the, you don't have room for this, but it's so wonderful, I'm going to tell it anyway. He positions himself, he's six, almost 6'4", six, 6'3", six, and 7'8". He positions himself so he can stand on the bottom of the pool. And Califano, who's only 5'10", I think, is in the deeper water. And he has to tread water all the time that Johnson is talking. And Johnson keeps poking him in the chest as he's making the point. So Califano keeps going under. But what he's telling Califano, I want a whole legislative program for 1966 to expand these programs. But by 1966, he sent hundreds of thousands of men to Vietnam. There's no more money for anything. There's not enough support in Congress for anything. They're all focused on Vietnam. So a lot of his plans for the safety net didn't get realized. Vietnam is a rightful part of LBJ's legacy. It's an important pillar in the legacy that he leaves behind. Mark Uptongrove is a presidential historian and the president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation in Austin, Texas. But you can hear in those taped telephone conversations of Lyndon Johnson in the presidency his anguish and his profound ambivalence about Vietnam. On May 27, 1964, President Johnson talked with National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy about the war in Vietnam. I'll tell you, the more I just stayed awake last night thinking about this thing, the more I think of it, I don't know what in the hell uh, it looks like me we're getting into another Korea. It just worries the hell out of me. I don't see what we can ever hope to get out of there with once we're committed. You have to look at, at Vietnam in the larger context of the Cold War. There was the belief, the firm belief among 
uh, most of the establishment in Washington that if you let one nation fall to communism, that other nations would fall in turn as uh, the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China would become emboldened. It was important to stave off the communist insurgency there. Now, now, of course, if you start running the communist, they may just chase you right into your own kitchen. Yeah, that's the trouble. And that is what the rest of the uh, that half of the world is going to think if this thing comes apart on us. That's that's the dilemma. And and that was a belief that was held by Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower, and John F. Kennedy before Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, though, made the decision to escalate the war in Vietnam. And when public opinion started turning against the war in 1966 and 67 and 68, Johnson continued to hold the line, even though he wanted to find a, a peaceful way out of the conflict. He just couldn't do it. Once I believe the Chinese communists coming into it. I don't think that we can fight them 10,000 miles away from home and ever get anywhere on, uh, in that area. I don't think it's worth fighting for, and I don't think we can get out. And it's just the biggest damn mess. It I is. Have, so. It's an awful mess. But it's a mess that he couldn't resolve. And he kept on doubling down on Vietnam. So it's not fair to lay the blame of Vietnam solely at the feet of Lyndon Johnson, but he is certainly one of the architects of the war. And and you can blame him for escalating it. The war in Vietnam didn't only affect the legacy of LBJ and the war on poverty. It set off a cascade of doubt that would undermine the governmental safety net itself. By 67 and 68, it's not simply the cost of Vietnam that is hurting social safety net programs, it's the politics. Again, Julian Zelizer, author of Lyndon Johnson and the Fierce Urgency of Now. It's eroding the coalition that he had put together so carefully to get these programs. And liberals are starting to turn on the president. The left is starting to see him not as someone with grandiose ideas, but more of the same, a broken political establishment. So by the time you hit the 68 convention, the costs of Vietnam are absolutely immense on the great society, which Johnson himself would talk about uh, in in future years before he dies. But the thing is, he was the architect of the war. Uh, And it was political calculations which often got him deeper and deeper. He wanted to protect his political coalition. He didn't want to be seen as weak on defense. He didn't want to be seen as the president who withdrew from a conflict. But all those calculations ended up doing exactly what Hubert Humphrey warned in 65. It undermined his domestic agenda and the standing of his presidency. And even though all that happened, and even though Johnson ended up a defeated president who doesn't run for re-election, it is still remarkable how much of the programs are with us today. The Voting Rights Act lasts for a long time and has very demonstrable effects on black registration, on the number of black officials, elected officials throughout the country. The Civil Rights Act, for all its flaws and limits, does end legally sanctioned segregation in places like public accommodations. Head Start has been a key part of education, as is the money that comes from the federal government. And Medicare and Medicaid, like today people don't even really think of them as controversial. I was struck when President Obama proposed his health care program in 2009. Part of the proposal would impose cuts on Medicare to save costs and use that money for other parts of health care. And opponents of his plan, right-wing Tea Party opponents, would carry signs, keep your government hands off my Medicare, which is just the most remarkable way of thinking of it. And it's definitely funny, and people point out it's so hypocritical, but it also captures, I think, how enduring the Great Society became to the point where even a conservative would defend that is obviously part of the status quo and not something that is going to be subject for change. So you can look all around the United States today and see Great Society programs still with us and programs like Medicaid, which have become much bigger, cover more 
things and more people, uh, and also are pretty popular as a product of this period, and I think that's quite remarkable. So with very little praise for Johnson's safety net vision and legislation in his time, and his ultimate defeat in Vietnam, we asked Robert Caro. Do you think he was proud of the work that he did on the safety net? You know, yeah, it's a good question. The answer is yes and no. He's really proud at the time. Like, you know, he had his school was like a one-room school in which every grade was there, like up to high school. They were all in one school. When he signs the education bill, you know, in 1965, he says, I want the signing to be at that schoolhouse. It's still there. It's down the road from the Johnson Ranch. It's like a corrugated tin dwelling. And he has his teacher who he's found, and she's in her 80s, but she's the, and he brings her there to sit beside him when he signs the education bill. And he says something like, this is a misquote, this is the most important piece of legislation that I've ever paid. I'm prouder of this, I worked harder on this, and I'm prouder on, of this than anything else that, I, that I've done. And that was a true belief. He also saw there was so much more to be done. He has all these dreams, great dreams, that you could say to fill in the holes of the safety net, you know? They're not realized, and they're not realized largely because of his Vietnam policies. But you say, nonetheless, he did so much. There's so much we don't have in America. There's so many holes in the safety net. But we also have so much more of a safety net than we had when Franklin Roosevelt became president. You say, oh, that's a long time. No, it's not. In terms of history, that's like a blink of history's eye. America has parts of a safety net. We just don't always think of it as a safety net. And in some ways, we can be forgiven for not understanding what is and isn't part of the American safety net and what role the government plays in all of this, because the ideological tide regarding the U.S. government's role in safety net systems was turning. Again, historian and biographer H.W. Brands. Lyndon Johnson knew no bounds to what government could do. And in fact, he thought that government, to use the analogy of the times, Americans could have guns and butter at the same time. So he didn't stint on spending on the war in Vietnam. So the defense budget was going up, even as the bill for all these programs was going up. But it probably couldn't last forever. And it contributed to the inflation of the 1970s. So Johnson leaves office in early 1969, having chosen not to run for election. He dies in 1973, really before the bill comes due, starting to come due. In the early 1970s, Richard Nixon basically had to take the United States off the international gold standard because there were just too many dollars floating around. The United States could not fund them all in gold. And the inflation of the 1970s was one of the consequences of the large federal deficits as a result of the Great Society. But in addition, in addition, when you propose a new program, you can paint it in the brightest colors because nobody can prove you wrong. But once the program is up in operation, then there are hitches that develop. And there it doesn't deliver on all its promises. And people thought they were promised this, and they didn't get that. And so in the case of politics, it's always a matter of what have you done for me lately. And in the 1970s, people began to think, maybe, maybe we overstretched here. And so maybe we should pull back. There was another fundamental aspect to this, and it's the foreign policy side, that confidence in government, Americans' confidence in government is absolutely essential in getting the support for new programs. If the federal government is going to start Medicare, is the government going to screw it up or is it going to run it well? 
coming out of World War II, Americans believed the government could accomplish what it set its mind to doing. In the 1960s, John Kennedy said, we're going to the moon. And Americans got to the moon by 1969. Boy, you know, you can't top that for if government sets its mind to do it, it can do it. But eventually, it started appearing the government couldn't do what it said it was going to do. Most, obviously, in Vietnam. Johnson said, we're going to win this war in Vietnam. The United States wound up losing the war in Vietnam. And then there was Watergate. So you can't trust government officials, even the president of the United States, when he says, I am not a crook. Yes, you are. And so the double whammy of Watergate and Vietnam causes Americans really to reconsider whether government is trustworthy and whether government can accomplish what it says it's going to accomplish. So Ronald Reagan has been saying all along, we shouldn't let government get bigger. We need to rein government. He's been saying this from 1964. And nobody was listening during the 1960s. He did get elected governor of California, but nobody was on a national stage, people weren't listening in the 1970s. They didn't even listen enough in 1976 when he tried to get the Republican nomination. But by 1980, after the oil shocks of the 1970s, after the Iranian Revolution, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, all this stuff that Ronald Reagan had sort of been predicting was going to happen, happened. Then Reagan is there. He also was an excellent candidate. Reagan had a smile on his face even when he was delivering this horrible bad news about all the terrible things that government has been doing. And so he seemed like a really likable guy. So Reagan wins. And the first thing that he says in his first inaugural address is, Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. And that is exactly the opposite to what Franklin Roosevelt had been saying, what Lyndon Johnson had been saying. For Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson, government was the solution. Reagan is saying, no, no, government is the problem. And so there is this watershed moment. At the age of FDR and Lyndon Johnson, it ends on the day that Ronald Reagan is inaugurated, when he says government is not the solution, government is the problem. And so when you have one of the major parties who consistently just attacks the idea of government, then the chance of elaborating the welfare state, forget it. If you look at the 1930s, when there were lots of new government programs, ambitious government programs, if you look at the mid-1960s, lots of new government programs, lots of ambition, and compare that with what has happened since Reagan became president. The number of new government programs you can count on one hand. And the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act of 2010, is a really good example. I mean, that, that was pretty ambitious, but it was merely the completion of something that Theodore Roosevelt had proposed a century before. So... We have lived in a different world since Ronald Reagan became president. So here at American Compassion, it's probably obvious that we admire LBJ and his work on the safety net. But that said, this series is about the American safety net. It's about how and where Americans find the help they need when they need it. It's about the history of how Americans think about wealth and poverty, philanthropy and aid. It's about what works and what doesn't. It's about the intellectual framework of today's safety net. And even though Reaganism brought in a different approach to the government's role in the safety net, it didn't mean American compassion was lost. Aaron Gray is the founder and CEO of Find Help, a software company that helps organizations connect their communities to local social care resources. His work to modernize the American safety net via the findhelp.org network and his focus on supporting people in need have been largely shaped by his childhood living paycheck to paycheck, his challenges to find help for his mother, and his academic work at the University of Texas in the LBJ School of Public Affairs. There was an advisor to George W. Bush that used to teach in the building across the street. Uh, Marvin Olasky was his name. And Marvin was big in faith-based interventions for social services. And I took his class. It was fascinating and it was fun. And he's a great writer. And, uh, and he wrote a book called The Tragedy of American Compassion. And I read it and I loved it. Part of his thesis was that when the public safety net started happening, the neighbors quit helping neighbors because they felt like, oh, they have an outlet. 
so they'll be taken care of. But he studied sort of the history of the safety net. And it was neighborhoods because there wasn't a safety net. So they would take in relatives and take in neighbors. It was more communal. Um, they'd look out for each other a little bit more. And so his thesis was that, well, maybe we made communities worse off because when people go through a, a trying time, it's in the messiness where we get closer to each other. And, and again, my mom, even though we had seven kids, there were two different times where two teenagers, both happened to be seniors in high school, didn't have a place to live. And she took them in. You know, we weren't wealthy at all, but we figured it out. And so I was really intrigued by that book. And, and I guess you sort of take the government side of things and also the private safety net and you can't argue with the amount of good you know that churches and uh, faith-based and uh, other organizations are doing to help the percentage of food pantries that are affiliated with religious institutions are huge so that's where people congregate still that's where neighbors help neighbors and that's why i believe that if you look at alaski's point it's an outstanding point in that are people not helping out because they think that there's an alternative? But I really think that with information in the right moment in time, people should be able to get the help. It just should happen automatically. Because I also worked in the bureaucracy and the amount of money that the United States spends on the social safety net per capita for a country that's large, it, it's so much money. And I just don't think it's being spent efficiently. In fact, I know that it's not. So if you just sort of accept the fact that there's enough money to solve poverty in the United States, if we could all just sort of accept that, then we start talking about how. We know there's injustice. We know there's intolerance. We know there's discrimination and hate and suspicion. And we know there's division among us. But there is a larger truth. We have proved that great progress is possible. We know how much still remains to be done. And if our efforts continue, and if our will is strong, and if our hearts are right, and if courage remains our constant companion, then, my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. American Compassion is an exploration of the past, present, and future of the American safety net, produced in Austin and Houston, Texas, with support from Find Help. Michael Zapruder and Sam Littman arranged and composed the music for this show with Jeff Olson on drums, Mike St. Clair on bass, and Sam Littman on keyboard. Special thanks to our guests for this episode. Erin Gray, H.W. Brands, Julian Zelizer, Martha Bailey, Mark Updegrove, and Robert Caro. Also thanks to the Miller Center at the University of Virginia, the American Presidency Project at the University of California, Santa Barbara, the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum, and the LBJ Presidential Library and Museum in Austin, Texas, for their consultation and use of archived materials. Francis Cutter was our intern for this episode. Jim Tuttle is our advising editor, and Rebecca McEnroy is our executive producer. For American Compassion, I'm Michael Zapruder. Thanks for listening.